It is my honor to uh, present to you Lawrence W. Rogers, who will be delivering the final message uh, on this pathway. His subject will be from the Bible Belt to the Sun Belt. And again, as in the last session, if time permits, we will do questions and answers. Go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll govern accordingly at the end. Uh, Lawrence W. Rogers is the senior minister of Westside Church of Christ in Baltimore, Maryland. He has over 10 years of diverse experience in congregational leadership in the areas of mentoring, preaching, advising, church growth, administration, and strategic planning. He is also a researcher, lecturer, published writer, and social advocate. Lawrence graduated with honors from Howard University with a Master of Divinity and received his bachelor's from Harding University. Lawrence is ha happily married to Betty, and they are the proud parents of two children. Without further ado, Lawrence Rogers. All right, greetings, family. I'm just so grateful to be here uh, with you all. I'm grateful to the uh, Carl Swain Center and to uh, Dr. Jerry Taylor for this introduction. Uh, for from uh, and from the, for this introduction, I'm grateful to Brother Curtis uh, for, for Curtis King, and I'm also grateful to the good folks at ACU uh, for providing this space to have these uh, crucial uh, and critical conversations. I want to also thank uh, the the 45 people who are left in attendance. I've been watching the the numbers. Uh, all day, they have become less and less, but that's okay. You know, I'm grateful for for those who have stayed here because I know that uh, the uh, that those who have stayed are really in tune uh, and want uh, the message and presentation. So I I thank you all for your patience uh, and uh, waiting for the the final presentation, uh, which is mine today. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting on the book uh, from the Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Plain Folk Religion, Grassroots Politics, and the Rise of Evangelical Conservatism. All righty. So before I begin, I would like to uh, briefly discuss the book, uh, The Grapes of Wrath. What is this book about? Uh, by uh, The book is written by Darren Duchuk. Uh, what, what is this book about? This book. Uh, tells the story of what happened to the folks after The Grapes of Wrath ended. Uh, for those of us who've read The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, uh, it's a book about uh, people who were deeply struggling through the depression. And uh, when one gentleman gets out of jail, he goes back home, he sees his family's not there, he goes up the street, sees his family's about to head out west. Why are they heading out west? because they heard about economic opportunity out West. Uh, they go out West and, you know, the, the, the struggle to get there is hard. Uh, it's very, it's, it's hardship, it's tall, and they go out West and they find themselves, uh, that the work is not as abundant as they thought it would be. And they find themselves being exploited uh, by, the, uh, by the entrepreneur class of people. And, and they find themselves unifying under their collective poverty. So, you know, that the, the Grapes of Wrath ends, it, it ends in like a, a tragic way. There's death, um, but there's also hope because uh, someone is nurse and the, 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 uh, the, 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 the nursing, for those who read this, the nursing symbolizes the people coming together as one. Okay, and so they come together as one under their collective identity as being poor. I have this clip, which is from the final scene of The Grace of Wrath. I'm going to try to play this here. We'll see how this goes. Uh, let me. 20 days work. Oh, boy. No, I'll be glad to get my hands on some cotton. That's the kind of picking I understand. Maybe. Maybe 20 days work and maybe no days work. We ain't got it till we get it. What's the matter, Ma? Getting scared? Scared? <laughs> I ain't never gonna be scared no more. I was, though. For a while, it looked as though we was beat. Good and beat. Looked like we didn't have nobody in the whole wide world but enemies. Like nobody was friendly no more. It made me feel kind of bad and scared, too. Like we was lost and nobody cared. You're the one that keeps us going, Ma. I ain't no good no more, and I know it. 
Seems like I spend all my time these days thinking how it used to be. Thinking of home. I ain't never going to see it no more. Well, Pa, a woman can change better than a man. A man lives sort of, well, in jerks. Baby's born or somebody dies and that's a jerk. He gets a farm or loses it and, and that's a jerk. With a woman, it's all in one flow like a stream. The ladies and waterfalls, but the river, it goes right on. A woman looks at it that way. Well, uh, maybe. Maybe we sure taking a beating. I know. <laughs> That's what makes us tough. Rich fellas come up and they die, and their kids ain't no good and they die out. But we keep a coming. We're the people that live. They can't wipe us out, they can't lick us. We'll go on forever, Pa, because we're the people. So we will go on forever because we are the people. And you can even hear in this clip, you know, uh, how they talked about the oppression that they experienced by the wealthy elites. So what happened to them afterwards? Like, I mean, what, what happened to those people? That's really what the, from the Baba Belt to Sun Belt is about. Um, the plain folk is who, like you just saw in the clip, like that's how the author would describe plain folk. Um, and so like what happened to them? And that's what we're going to be dealing with um, in, in this in this in the session. I think it's important to note about the video as well is how important origin stories are. Um, so, you know, where people come from, you know, their origin story. So, you know, my, you know, my, my, my family traveled here during depression and we made something out of ourselves or my family was first generation immigrant from so-and-so and we built ourselves, you know, we, we went through struggle. We went, we built ourselves on institutions and things like this. Like the, the, the origin stories are, uh, are a critical part of a, of a person's existence. And, and, and sometimes various people's or, or origin stories clash. And so, and, and oftentimes people will romanticize the origin story uh, in, in, in a way that will be advantageous to their, to their agenda today. And, and, and that's what we're going to deal with here. So in the early chapters of, of this book, we find a man named uh, John Von Druff, who was a World War II veteran. We find his story is used to describe the journey of plain folk. He moved from Midwest uh, to California. This book is heavily centered on California. And one of the reasons why the book is so heavily centered on California is to explain the advent of Ronald Reagan. So how, how do we get to Reagan? And so the book's going to really pretty much start in the 30s and in the Depression era, and it's going to show us how we, how we get to Ronald Reagan. Um, the Great Depression drove people uh, westward during the 1930s, and Dolchik identifies three types of migrants. There was plain folk, there was preachers, and there was business people, entrepreneurs. The plain folks became suburbanites. He mentions in the book how they, they did not want to live in the urban environment. They did not want to live in the high rises. And, and back then, of course, it was a lot less expensive to live in the suburbs. So they chose to live in the suburbs. The preachers came and built churches for the folks living in the suburbs. And the entrepreneurs came and started businesses and colleges to spread the Christian faith and the doctrines of free market capitalism. And I think that uh, that is really the, the point that really needs to stick is how, that as you see what the Grapes of Wrath uh, clip, how there, and how uh, John Steinbeck writes about, you know, how there was angst uh, amongst the working class and animosity uh, against, the, against the entrepreneur class. But how did that change? How, how do we find the uh, Christian evangelical, the white Christian evangelical uh, working class becoming uh, super uber supportive of the entrepreneur class? Well, um, Duchek would argue that it happened through religion. It happened through Christianity. They, they used Christianity 
uh, to co-opt plain folk like the people who we saw in a video from Great of Ref uh, into uh, the uh, business class's agenda. And that's really what this book is about. Following the tumult of the uh, 1940s and increasingly agitated by the polarized climate of Cold War California, Southern evangelical plain folk preachers and entrepreneurs forged a powerful political front on behalf of the emerging conservative uh, movement. Um, and before I go any further, I just want to thank Dr. Francis for his wonderful presentation. It is, it is always uh, a pleasure uh, to have to present after Dr. Francis, but I just want to make sure I don't forget that. God bless you, Dr. Francis, and I'll, I'll always enjoy uh, hearing you lecture um, and uh, for your passion. I, don't, I would be remiss if I didn't say that. So, yeah, and, and they were different from the, uh, they were different from the uh, evangelicals who are already there, okay? Uh, quoting from the book, it says the Southern evangelicals also had a distinctive disposition that they imposed on the Golden State. Like all other evangelicals, they held fast to a certain core tenets, the primacy of individual conversion, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible, and the scriptural injunction to witness for Christ. But it was the way that upheld them that set them apart. One could say that they exuded Texas theology, <laughs> uh, certain of the absolute rightness of their doctrine, unwilling to compromise this doctrine, but always open to new ways of proselytizing it. So, you know, they went to California where the evangelicals were kind of laid back and they came with a more hard lined approach to their faith where they felt like they were absolutely right, according to uh, the author on their doctrine, unwilling to compromise this doctrine that they had, uh, but always open to new ways of trying to proselytize. They were dedicated to strong, single-minded leaders. Southern evangelicals displayed a gritty determination and a spirit of pragmatism that distinguished them in California's religious climate. Unlike mainline liberal Protestants, they possessed little patience for urban sensibilities. In comparison to Southern California's resident evangelicals who turned serious, quiet, intense, humorless, sacrificial, and patient in the peak religious experience, these Southern sojourners were always busy, vocal, and promotional and task oriented, right? So for those of us who grew up in the South, we may hear that and say, we thought everybody was like that, right? <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, the, according to the author, this was something that's distinct to Southern Christians, Southern evangelicals. And when they went to, when they moved to migrate to California, they brought that with them. And, and it was, you know, it was, uh, it was unique uh, to the experience of the uh, uh, Christian, Christian experience uh, in uh, the area at that time. All right. Post-war Southern California provided the ideal proving ground for this temperament. Its decentralized and deregulated suburban layout was perfectly suited to Texas theology's emphasis on congregational freedom and autonomy and neighborhood witness. And its Hollywood culture and competitive marketplace of ideas, resources, and influence drew out this faith's innate inventiveness and combativeness. Granted, a cosmopolitan Southern California imposed itself on Southern evangelicalism to, to by, um, by compelling it to trim some of its harder edge tendencies, its racial views, for instance, and resistance and interdenominational cooperation. Over time, Southern evangelicals embraced this uh, this notion in part to remain viable in the competition for converts. The bottom line though is that Texas theology's encounter with a Southern California style forged a vigorous cultural force, one that melded the traditionalism into an uncentered, unbounded religious culture of entrepreneurialism, experimentation, and engagement. In short, into a Sun Belt creed. And I um I want to apologize for reading all of that, but I felt that it was critical uh, to hear about the transformation of the of the uh, the 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 Christian evangelical uh, experience in California because of this migration. Uh, going back to the cover of the book, you can see that Billy Graham was on the cover of the book. Um, real briefly, I might mention that 
you know, Billy, Billy Graham being on the cover, he's not mentioned in the book as much as you would expect him to be. I've seen his cover photos on the book, but I do think it's important to notate Billy Graham uh, and a few things that the book mentions about Billy Graham. It, it, the book states that by and large, Southern California, Southern Baptists did not find solace in the platitudes of preachers or politicians who harkened back to Jim Crow. Rather, they follow the lead of Billy Graham, who, like Reagan, endorsed a colorblind conservatism that stemmed from his trust in individualism and doubts about the efficacy of government programs. His confidence in his philosophy remained unwavering. Even after touring Watts in August 1965, during this visit in South Central Los Angeles, Graham, he was decked out in a bulletproof vest and allowed to see the damage to South Central from the bird's eye view of a helicopter. The experience left the, the usually temperament evangelical, uh, the, 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 the usually even temper evangelist, evangelist angry at the total disregard for authority. He worried about sinister forces at work in the nation and, can, and convinced that a great racial revolution was, was just begun. In much the same way, Reagan could tease out the racially inflicted message of law and order politics without ever speaking in his harshest tones, Graham used the Watts encounter to express his displeasure with a radicalized civil rights movement and the welfare state that had helped create those circumstances. Torn by competing emotions, Graham nevertheless insisted that God is colorblind and that racial injustice was at root a personal sin best solved by a spiritual regeneration. So I think it's just important to note how uh, for a person trying to uh, balance uh, racial prejudice with their faith, Billy Graham's message would have been very useful. Um, and I think that what we hear from Billy Graham really set the tone for what we see from the uh, Christian right today, which uh, in some circles we would call this uh, kind of code switching, uh, you know, kind of speaking in code or uh, using, uh, some might even call this dog whistles, um, a sort of spiritualizing uh, that Billy Graham uses uh, to communicate uh, his uh, displeasure um, with uh, the things that he saw in Watts. But I also want to point out that uh, God is colorblind is absolutely, uh, is absolutely a false doctrine. Um, and uh, and that, 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 I, that is absolutely not true. To, 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 to say that God is colorblind is it's like saying that um, it's looking at a picture from Van Gogh up a portrait from Van Gogh and saying Van Gogh is colorblind. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. But Van Gogh was the creator of the portrait and Van Gogh intentionally used the different colors because he believed that it was gonna to portray the beauty that he wanted to be expressed uh, via that portrait. But this, to say God is, is colorblind is, is really an erasure. And in a dominant society, it's a message of assimilation into whatever the dominant culture is and and in America that is that is whiteness but Billy Graham was lifted up and filled coliseums in California he visited California many times and had a large base in California and was a a, a hallmark for the development of the the Christian right evangelical movement in California, and of course, his son Franklin Graham uh, carries on that work uh, today that that his father started. Uh, and uh, again, you know, through dog whistles and racialized uh, spirituality, or you know, uh, trying to spiritualize racialisms, I should say, uh, you know, there is still prejudice here, and one can hide their prejudice very well. And this particular message that Graham demonstrates. And so in the book here, you know, um, uh, Darren Duchick does a good job of, of showing that and portraying that. He also talks about the rise of the Christian right. And he mentions briefly uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., 
who passed away in 2007. Uh, he was an American Baptist Southern pastor, a televangelist, and a conservative activist. Uh, he was um, he's the uh, founder of the uh, what was the Lynchburg Christian Academy, but now it's Liberty Christian Academy, and founded Liberty University, um, which uh, which that that is very important. Uh, he that he founded Liberty University because a major part of the um, entrepreneur's agenda in this book that uh, Doshik chose us is that they wanted to use Christian academies as training grounds, um, as, uh, as uh, places for indoctrination into a conservative pro-capitalistic agenda, right? And so we, we see Liberty University carrying out that work today. Um, I believe it happens, I think it is either the largest private Christian university uh, but it's definitely up there. It's, it's very large. It's a big operation, and they are not quiet um, about those conservative, uh, fr uh, radical, pro-free market, uh, capitalistic values. Uh, and so they are doing what that school and others like it. We're going to find some that are close to home later. They are doing what they were designed to do. Uh, and and so... Uh, for, uh, Falwell was an architect of that. He was also the architect of the Moral Majority Movement uh, in 1979, which uh, Dochik believes and many other people believe was a critical uh, piece for Ronald Reagan uh, uh, being elected. Uh, you know, it, it, it helped Ronald Reagan to be able to uh, bring in the, the, the Christian right uh, as a major voting block uh, for him. And so uh, Falwell... Uh, is is critical when we talk about the development of the Christian right in California. And I wanted to play this brief clip for us, if I can, uh, get a, if I can be so fortunate to get yet a uh, another clip to play. Well, the country's about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's "I Have a Dream" speech. At this point, it's almost impossible to imagine that it was ever controversial to want to honor Dr. King. But in 1983. It certainly was to Jerry Falwell when he came on Crossfire. Why not? I don't think we need any more holidays. Why not a Martin Luther King Day? Uh, I just uh, feel that there are other black Americans and the corporate body of black Americans who are due honor more than one recent individual about whom there's a great question mark even to this moment. What is the question mark? Uh, the question mark is that uh, so far all the records on him are sealed. And neither you, Tom, nor I really know you, what they're going to say. Are you talking about his personal character, yes, and his personal correct. morality, and his yes. personal life, and he may as well as, as any connection? He may be as clean as Billy Graham, but we don't know that because the records are I thought that was very interesting that he says that he might be as clean as Billy Graham, but the records are sealed. Um, so lifting up Billy Graham as just this hallmark and just this perfect, perfect person, um, I would also find it interesting how Jerry Falwell Sr. would respond to, to the moral um, failings, if you will, of his son, Jerry Falwell Sr. Real quickly, as a footnote, what you'll notice is for those who are in marginalized groups, when they, when they fail, that's a harsh, it's a harsh uh, demonization of, of them. But for those who have positions of power, when they fail, people oftentimes will quote David. Well, King David failed. King David, you know, uh, King David did wrong with Bathsheba and Uriah. So, it's, but it's very interesting that with people who don't have power, that you know, King David is rarely brought up and quoted. And so, um, so, but nevertheless, we find Billy, uh, we find uh, Billy Graham being lifted here. Um, as the ideal preacher while Dr. King is being questioned and uh, viewed with suspicion. Again, we find these uh, whistles being used, these uh, dog whistles uh, being used to communicate something to the base that they feel they just cannot come out and say directly. All right. Entrepreneurs, the, the principles, and I, I want to do with entrepreneurs, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneur aspect so uh, we talked about the plain folk and we talked about the preachers. Now I want to talk about the business folks, the entrepreneurs, the principles of the system were rooted in the early 19th century American populism. 
the efficacy of pristine capitalism and unbridled optimism about the freedom and power of the individual conscience, a belief in the rightness of government by a popular consensus, and most importantly, a, a commitment to the sanctity of the local community. These Jeffersonian precepts uh, came wrapped in a package of Christian, plainful Americanism, and all encompassing and an all encompassing worldview that gave white Southerners, especially, a sense of guardianship over their society. And I mean, I think we still see that today. That you know, we find. Um, I mean, it, it brings up white Southerners, but it's not just white Southerners. I mean, if if you uh, notice. <clears throat> As north as north as you can get, you know, it's one of the, one of the northern states. Uh, you know, they have people coming to their uh, to the state buildings with automatic weapons, saying that government tyranny was here because we're asked to wear masks and social distance. So we have to go down to the state buildings with, you know, M16s and um, and, and 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 big guns to because we are the guardians of the society. We are the patriots. Like it's I, no, the book says it's a southern white southerners, but it's I don't think it's just southerners. Um, and no, I think I think that may be scapegoating a bit. Uh, and all due respect to the author, I think it's something that we find in North. It, it was right in Philadelphia, as well. Uh, they did the same thing in Philadelphia. It was here in Maryland, uh, too, where I live. And so it's something that is is all over this view that white people have this a sense of guardianship, particularly white Christians, white Christian or the white Christian right, I should say, have a sense of guardianship over society. That, that um, this, this idea that we have got to be the patriots, we've got to be willing to, to fight the government, to fight anybody at all, at, all, uh, at, at any given second. We, we find it in um, the, the, the uh, recently people who go pick up guns and go shoot at uh, people protesting uh, racial uh, prejudice and white supremacy, and people pick up guns and go shoot at them, kill kill people. A young man goes and kills people, and we find him even being uh, talked about well by the president of the United States, right? As if he is also a guardian over the society. He's a patriot. So, so we 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 find this. Um, happening uh, not just in the South, but it's all over. And this is how we get to it, all right? F so, nevertheless, uh, fully committed to these ideas and the rights and privileges they prescribe to Southern evangelical plain folk preachers, entrepreneurs assume for protecting their communities and country from those who would undermine them, all right? So anybody who would undermine them, they have got to protect their institutions, their country, from those who would undermine their ideas and the rights and their privileges. So if if you if people can't understand all of the videos of people getting very upset because the grocery store asked them to wear a mask, this is why. This is why. All right. Okay. So he talks about the Southern Evangelical Aaron, and he brings up three dimensions to this. He said, "Plain folk migrate from the South and Midwest of California." Southern preachers start churches in California suburbs that the plain folks attend who migrated from the other areas. And finally, we discover the third dimension of the Southern Evangelical Aaron in boardrooms and classrooms where a small but influential group of entrepreneurs work quietly behind the scenes to build a network of schools from Southern California to South Carolina meant to instill Christian values in young Americans. These institutions were also conceived as conservative counterweights to state-sponsored colleges which evangelical entrepreneurs held responsible for the New Deal state-controlled economy and society slide towards as the society slide towards secularism. Motivated by religious convictions, these three dimensions of the Southern era were politically subversive. So we've got to understand that. Uh, now, this book, the author, as far as I can tell in my research, the author is not a member of the Church of Christ. He's not a member of the Restoration Movement. But he gives George Benson a lot of credit. George Benson, uh, former uh, former president, uh, excuse me, the, uh, yes, the, the former president of uh, Harding Harding uh, University, Harding College. He gives him a whole lot of credit for the establishment of the 
Christian right. In fact, uh, I believe, uh, uh, you know, over about, what, nine years ago, I read this book while a student at Harding University, and I was shocked to find out what George Benson was doing. There's a lot of notes I have here, but for the sake of time, I'm going to try to sum it up. But, you know, George Benson, when he came in to Harding uh, as the, the president, the school was uh, broke, broke. I mean, it was strapped for cash. The school didn't think it was going to survive. George Benson came in. He was kind of fueled by uh, McCarthyism. He had spent time in China as a missionary and just became very pro-capitalistic while he was in China. And so he, he came back to America and eventually, you know, he ends up in his post at Harding uh, College and uh, he replaces uh, J.N. Armstrong and the, the school was, was dying. It was broke. But what he does is he brings in wealthy entrepreneurs to the school. And, and what was amazing is, is that, you know, this is back in Church of Christ days where, you know, and, and it's still like this for many people, but, you know, it was very sectarian. The Church of Christ was very sectarian back then. It, 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 you know, there's been some improvements on this, but, you know, back then it was worse. But he's bringing in entrepreneurs from different, you know, Southern Baptists and, you know, uh, people from other groups. He's bringing entrepreneurs and they are mixing Christianity with pro-business ideas. He's building institutions. He's traveling to California. He's giving speeches. Um, he's a critic of, of anything that is progressive. Like, uh, so he's, he's, he's a strong critic of anything progressive. He was very pro-segregation. Uh, uh, and uh, he uh, had critiques about the New Deal um, and, 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 and other things that he was, he was, you know, did not like things that were progressive. He, he brought folks in uh, who were business folks and the author kind of credits Benson or gives him a great deal. I mean, it's a very large section about Benson in the book. Uh, gives him a, a lot of, you know, page time for the help in bringing this philosophy together of pro-business, pro-Christian, the business world using the academy to promote their free market capitalistic values. The Christian academy is being used for that for, to promote these right-wing uh, uh, Christian right values. And so even though the, the Harding wasn't a part of their denomination for many of them, because they care a lot about, you know, uh, uniting the right, I sort of speak, uh, they gave that money uh, to the, the school. Now, I remember my first tour of Harding University. I'm, I'm sure it's still there when I was thinking about going. And I remember walking in the, um, in the uh, there's like a, a, a greeting center. I forgot what it was called. And there's a, there's a huge picture of, of, of first off, before you get to the picture, it's a line of different um, politicians who have spoken. Uh, last time I checked, they were all Republicans who have spoken. Then there's a huge picture of Sam Walton. You know, Sam Walton's from Arkansas. And I remember asking my tour guide, I said, is Sam Walton a member of the Church of Christ? They said no. And then they just kept walking. And I was like, but why is he on the wall? This is why. What Duchik is explaining is why Sam Walton is on the wall. Sam Walton was a big donor to Harding. I believe the Walton family still is because of this very dynamic of using Christian institutions as subversives for the ideology of the Christian right and pro-business free market capitalism. So this is how we get the conversion of the, the, the Grapes of Wrath family into the Christian right that's now no longer critiquing the entrepreneur class, but now they are very pro the entrepreneur class that is exploiting exploiting them like everybody like everybody else. And so so that that that's another instrument. We also find here um uh uh George Pepperdine uh who was a um he was uh a auto auto man out in um the Golden State as well. He sold, uh, he's an auto supply salesperson, and we see similar dynamics with him wanting to use Pepperdine in the same way 
uh, and and helping to fund Pepperdine, um, and uh, and we find in Norbell Young a similar dynamic with Benson, and in fact Norbell Young and Benson communicated with one another, where they are using the school for not only the cultivation of Christian values, but to promote the views of people like Barry Goldwater and others. And uh, this is something that the book documents here as well. So uh, there's a whole lot more I could say about that, but for the sake of time, <clears throat> I'm going to move on. Along with Benson and George Pepperdine emerged an important, important liaisons between religious and non-religious conservatives, elite Republicans, and disenfranchised plain folk Democrats. Uh, so it's important to know why they were disenfranchised. Well, many of them were many of them became disenfranchised after the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Act. They became very disenfranchised after that, after after America's desegregation efforts. And so many of them were, you know, the Southern strategy, they were brought into the Republican Party, the formerly uh, disenfranchised plain folk Democrats. All right. There, and through extensive mass communications placed under the direction of Harding's National Education Program, Benson hoped to move public opinion at the grassroots in the direction of godliness and patriotism. The reason why I included this was just to show that it wasn't just moved towards godliness. It was moved towards godliness and patriotism, which is Christian nationalism to, synch to try to synchronize patri uh, your, your uh, patriotic views with your Christian views. The, the, uh, real quickly, the problem with patriotism is every state does right and wrong. When you practice Christian nationalism, then you uh, essentially say, say that the things that your state does that, that are wrong were good. That's the reason why we find people saying now, as uh, Dr. Francis brought up, that, you know, some people say, well, we should not critique the founding fathers. And, you know, I've watched recent speeches from folks on the, on the right who have very, have very strongly are opposed to people looking at the Founding fathers and and American history for the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we we find people now who don't want that. They only want us to talk about good things and to give a uh, uh, a a a a revisionist version of the history that can keep the godliness and the patriotism on the same plateau, but ultimately uh, their family. That is idolatry. All right. And so it also says, and to rally average Americans to reverse the pernicious government policies restricting markets and states' rights. So you see, Benson was using the school, and, and this is going on as well with, um, thank you so much, Curtis, for the time check. Benson, Benson is using uh, the, the, the school uh, to, for a political agenda, and he's very open about it as well. Um, so uh, the rallying of average Americans to reverse pernicious government policies restricting markets and states' rights, right? And so, you're, you're, so you're, the students are going to school and they are being indoctrinated into a way of thinking about the marketplace, about capitalism, about the government, about entrepreneurs, about business, uh, about right wing. And, and this is where we find the development of the Christian right. The book ends with how we get to Ronald Reagan, right? Because, I mean, Ronald Reagan at the time was a bit of an anomaly. And this is this is kind of unique to uh, Trump as well. Trump is a bit of a uh, he's he's a bit of, of the same, you know. Uh, Trump, who apparently was a Democrat all his life, at least they stay, a yeah, New Yorker, and 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 uh, you know being being in New York, which is typically looked at as a more liberal place. Uh, Trump comes out with with values and 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 ideas that don't seem <laughs> succinct with what you would expect from a New Yorker who, uh, you know, parlayed with Democrats for a, a big part of his life. Reagan was the same way. Ra Reagan, Reagan was an anomaly. And this book is helping us to understand how we got Reagan. When Reagan, it was a collective effort to unite the Christian right. And, and I think that we, we see that happening again. Um, so, I mean, even for Church of Christ folks, like you see, like there is a there's a movement now, and I, I'm not I don't want to question the intentions, but I do think we should always kind of look at things sometimes with suspicion. Why now is the movement 
like letting go of, and I, I mean, and I, I'm glad they're letting go of it, but I'm asking why now are they letting go of distinct things like the one true church isms, like the position on instruments, these very things that kind of separated them from other denominations, other groups, why are they letting that go right now? And it's, it's, it's predominantly white churches letting these things go right now. If, we, if most, most of the churches letting it go are predominantly white churches. Why are they letting it go? I think that some might be able to make an argument that it's being let go for the sake, again, of uniting the Christian right, or bringing together the Christian right from the various uh, major evangelical denominations, all right? So that happened to promote Reagan. One could argue that it's happening now again to support Donald Trump. All right, universities started to teach students conservative values, patriotism, and, and hyper free market capitalism, all right? Business people, preachers, and leaders, uh, and, and, and leaders of Christian schools work together on the same agenda. And then Reagan comes in, who he's called the great communicator, and I, I think I think that's a, a, a good description of Reagan because he was able to take mean things, harsh things, bigoted things like welfare queens, and say it in a way that communicated to his base exactly what he what he wanted to say. Don't trust poor black women. Like he was able to communicate that, in in, in very efficient ways. And similarly, with that sort of communication, he was also able to apply language to connect Goldwater ideals with Christian right values. And so that's how the book concludes with explaining how we get from Reagan, how we get the plain folk, how do they transition, how do they transform from the great Seraph folk to what we have now with the Christian right that oftentimes vote against their own interests as poor and working class people. Thank you so much, you all, for your time. Wow. Um, I think that everyone will agree that that too was very enlightening. So thank you very much, uh, Brother Rogers, for sharing such in-depth information. Uh, again, a look at history so we can understand today. So we, we appreciate that thoroughly. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna look, I, I don't see any questions. Uh, let's see. I see really insightful, grateful for this session, uh, other other encouragement notes. Uh, so again, I wanna thank you for for taking the time to to research this and, and share with us from the heart. Um, so we, we are about to close out. Uh, so on behalf of the Carl Spain Center and the host, Dr. Jerry Taylor and Trice Prince, we wanna thank all of our presenters today. Um, if everyone was visible, we could do the hand clap and just uh, let you know how, how much we appreciate uh, all that you've done. So for all of our presenters, uh, this was very enriching.